So I can't actually, I don't think I can see what I'm presenting besides this. Okay, so that, that all looks basically people are getting photos of webbing that's broken. Yeah, and we can see kind of all of them like tiles at the same time. Yeah, yeah, perfect. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, sorry. So basically the point of this, um, it's not like at all to be some conclusive test and study. Um, it's basically to try and open up some sort of discussion on the use of straight stitch machines for sewn loops, which doesn't seem very commonplace in uh, in Highline webbings at the moment. I think um, uh, Stefan from Raid uses a straight stitch uh, method and so do, I saw a photo today on Slack chat, someone posted about it looking quite average and they weren't sure if it was strong enough for uh, highlining on. Um, basically that's another straight stitch example. Um, and what straight stitch is, is essentially anything that isn't a bar tack, uh, which everyone's most used to seeing on webbings. Um, so basically, yeah, this is the last couple months I've been doing some testing, um, broken maybe about 50 samples or so. And I've got some, you know, the basically the start of some results for um, just to open up that discussion. So what I've used is it's a walking foot compound feed machine. Um, I got recommended this guy, this by, but essentially the guy that invented or not invented, but uh, made the, the modern day portal edge possible. Um, so he's, you know, got a lot of experience in this area and, um, and yeah, from everything else I could see, uh, around the place, this seems you, you know, for heavier duty webbings, you need something that has a walking foot. Um, and this seems to do the job really well. Um, another thing that I've been recommended is silicon spray. So this can be used for slightly weaker machines to help you get through webbing. And I'm yet to like the samples that I've sprayed with silicon and tested, I didn't notice any decrease in strength, anything dramatic at least. Um, it would be really nice to see some actual testing into this, um, or at least, you know, it just says for ingredients, it just says petroleum, uh, petroleum based. So there's not really anything too detailed on that. Um, so I don't, I don't think it would decrease the strength of the webbing too much, but it would be good to know. Um, yeah, regardless, um, I did do some tests on a household machine, uh, years ago as well, doing a, uh, a bar tack. And essentially every like third or fourth, um, you know, row on the bar tack, the machine just shut down and broke because it couldn't handle the thickness of the webbing. And this was just getting through, through two layers of Feather Pro. But um, I eventually got through about, you know, nine tacks and used it, those stitches, those loops for quite a few years and broke them the other day. And they got surprisingly really good results. Um, they were within about 85, to 90% the strength of this, a same sample of Feather Pro just taken a meter further down the line. Um, so I was really surprised by that. So it seems mostly as long as the, the needle isn't cutting the fibers of the webbing, um, as long as you're getting enough stitches of, of thread through the, through the webbing, um, and as long as the webbing itself is decently strong and robust, just about anything will do the job. It's about, it's, um, after that, it depends on what pattern you use. And, and yeah, that's, that's about it. So we've got, um, yeah, so I had a couple different patterns. Which material are you using for the sewing itself? Uh, yeah, so that was the other thing. Um, so I tried uh, V69 thread and V138. V138 understandably seemed to, be stronger because it's a thicker thread. Um, the V69 still got reasonable results, but again, you just needed more laps of it. But then, you know, once you put more stitches in, you compromise the webbing more. So it was better to use a thicker thread. Although the V69 you can use in smaller machines, which is a plus. But uh, and it was still getting reasonable results. Which Material wise, for for everybody to understand, is this a polyamide or, or just polyester? Uh, uh, or nylon? 
bonded nylon. Uh, sorry, bonded polyester for the V one thirty eight. Cool. Is that um, is that fur? Yeah, that's me. That's me. How are you doing? How's it going? So I feel like you're probably more qualified to do this talk than I am. But um. Ah, uh, no, really. Um, I was expecting to have chain from Aspiring, which is the guy that actually do the sewing, uh, not me. Okay. Um, he was going to be in, but I didn't receive any communication from him at the moment. And um, he was interested as well as, as just having a look. I know that depending on the webbing you're going to do the sewing, you wouldn't use polyester or dynema on a nylon or polyamide webbing, but you can always use the nylon or polyamide um, thread just to go on any type of webbing because of the stretch, but that's something I guess you already know. Um, yeah, uh, yeah. You can you can keep going. I'm not, I'm not going to interrupt anymore. It's just no, thank no, you for the answer. That's a good. That's um, something I found interesting as well because the V69 I was using was bonded nylon, and it still didn't make too much of a tangible difference on uh, nylon webbings. So basically, on nylon webbings, the stretch of the thread wasn't uh, too important. It was more just that I couldn't get any high results unless it was a Bartak, basically. Um, I didn't test any Bartax, but the results I could get the highest was about 75% of the nylon webbing. So, Which is quite the same than the Bartax, yeah. Oh, okay. Okay, I was under the impression the Bartax were of a better result. A um, bit more sometimes, but not yeah. much. Yeah, so this is the pattern I used on the straight stitch, just trying to create three of these uh, really small kind of boxes, and that got the best result i've got a photo of that being tested yeah here which is what stefan is doing um on his webbing right yeah i think he's doing that but he's he's making them a bit longer yeah and, uh, yeah. and he's not doing a full box he's just going diagonally once um yeah which is essentially it's it seems like you you can get away with a surprisingly small size box i i tested just a single one of these in the in a bit of feather pro and it got, I think, about 80% the strength of the webbing. And then, you know, ones two or three times the length, like enormous boxes, they were getting about 5 or 10% higher. So it was surprising just how little stitching was required to get really, really high strengths. Um, but, yeah, the, the bigger problem with the nylon was it just, it just breaks this first bit of the webbing first and then a little bit more, a little bit more. Yeah. To the it's like a screamer. Even, yeah, exactly. So it's really hard to get that to pull on all the thread evenly. Yeah. Um, um, what about the amount of material used? I, I know you didn't you do Bartax, but Bartax are, are quite thick and dense, and those doesn't look that dense. Um, is it way less material? What, to what just make one, one to make one box, you need I don't know half a meter of nylon. Uh, where in Bartax, to do nine Bartax, you need two meters of nylon. Um, do you have any type of comparison like that? Uh, yeah, it would be nice if I had more accurate numbers than what I'm just pulling off the top of my head. But um, yeah, for like to make a longer box, like you know, one like this, um, that uses up. Uh, it's about half of a half a bobbin worth of thread. Like it uses a surprising amount, but to be fair as well, they're about 120 to 200 mil long. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I wish I had better figures for you on that. I, I tried as well. Uh, this is the same idea. Basically, instead of doing bar tacks, but just going straight back and forth with a straight stitch, um, did surprisingly well. At least this is some really old climbing, you know, climbing sling, and it just broke at the beaner. Um, but yet, you know, trying this on some other things, this again did surprisingly well, about 65%, 70%, which for nylon, you know, considering I tried this sample and this, this was about 50%, just going back and forth. Hmm. Um, yeah, using like using a straight stitch machine to do bar tacks like this, I found, you know, without the backwards and forth, you get on a bar tacking machine. Um, it essentially like tried to, it almost cut the webbing. So it got results that were a bit weaker because of that. So I'd be wary of people selling um, 
Bartex essentially that are on a, done on a straight stitch machine like this that aren't actually Bartex. Um, yeah, just for reference as well, these are, this is some of the this is the stuff I did on just a regular domestic um, home machine. Uh, those tacks, and they did surprisingly well. You know, um, this was yeah, this was the straight up and down. Didn't do very well. Uh, these are some other samples. I tried uh, first Dura Levita loops, um, and again, just straight up and down. Basically, yeah, I, I just thought this would be an interesting thing just to put some ideas ideas out in the community that um, it does work. It gets really good results if it's done right. And, you know, it, I don't know. I think this this is something that could be more more openly talked about, accepted in the community, whatnot. That's about it. I don't really have too much more to add to this chat. It was quite late notice and quite impromptu, but... <laughs> Hopefully that's interesting. I have a question, Chris. Um, mm -hmm. With the little boxes that you used, you said yeah. that um, three gave quite a good result, and then even one little box was impressively good. Did you yeah. find that at some point, like what does the curve look like? At what point does the trade-off, like is it not worth it to keep adding them? What improvement does each little box give? Is it better to have a few of the little ones or one big one? Uh, definitely. Um, it depends mostly on the material. Um, like in nylon, you want to have quite a few staged one after the other because you want to try and, I guess, uh, like equalize the tension between all of the boxes. You know, by having these breaks of webbing between the boxes, you allow the next bit of tension to kind of be transferred a little bit to the next one without it breaking all the stitching along the way. Um, whereas for uh, polyester it's it's much better just to have the box go longer to um uh, there should be a photo of a longer one around but yeah regardless it's it's better to, like because the webbing doesn't stretch as much it self equalizes the thread better if that makes sense so roughly two boxes to three for nylon and just one bigger one for polyester seem to be best As well, there's quite a few faults with this uh, testing. You know, like the travel distance on the machine wasn't very far. So, you know, I might get the sample up to about 20 kN and then have to reset it. Or well, like it's not 20 kN in this example, it was 20,000 psi. But um, yes, yeah, so you have to continuously reset the thing and get it that little bit further, a little bit further. Um, so, you know, that definitely compromised the strength of some of the samples. Yeah, were there any other questions? Oh, sorry. I just noticed there's the chat. No, yeah, cool. Well, I think if that's it, should we um should we move on to the next presentation? Next one is in like fifteen minutes. So Oh wow, fifteen. But yeah, oh, yeah um, look at that. I sped through that. <laughs> <laughs> it, it just takes people time to come up with questions, so don't feel like yeah, they yeah. don't have them. They're just thinking of how to ask something and not look silly. Yeah, yeah, no worries. Yeah, I, um, I did remember something else actually as well, was um, a theory as to why we have so many bar techs, like why it's so pre prevalent all over the climbing community and the Highline community. Um, well, the Highline community, obviously, because of the prevalence in the climbing community. But why there? Um, and I talked to John, who who recommended the machine, who's, uh, as I said before, basically the inventor of the portal edge. Um, he said in the in the 80s and the 90s, they did a bunch of testing on Bartex and other methods of stitching up their products together. And they said, well, he said that the Bartex were chosen in the end because of their abrasion resistance. You know, I presume that's because if a single tack in the middle gets worn out, it doesn't compromise the rest of the stitching as much. It still doesn't make it doesn't make quite as much difference for high line zone loops, at least, because it's unlikely, or I mean, at least like it's unlikely you get 
any abrasion on your loops whatsoever, unlike, you know, a dog bone in climbing does. But, um, yeah, that's one factor maybe. And then the other one, the most obvious is bar tacks are just a lot quicker and faster and easier to produce and easier to inspect. You know, a machine can make a bar tack in, in a couple seconds and it's going to be the same every time. It's very repeatable, re very reproducible. But, um, but the straight stitch method, it's, you know, it's good if you, if you don't have a bar tacking machine, but it's, um, yeah, it's just not quite as mass scalable. Um, I have a question. Uh, I've seen the bar tack machine. Yeah. Just doing the bar tacks. It goes very fast. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't know how they they change the pressure that you can put on the Bartek on the thread. Can mm -hmm. you do that with your testing? Have you done that with your testing? Or is it's always one 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 tension or pressure on the on the thread and that's it? Um, mm -hmm. Can you make that tighter or not? Like just to go through the webbing and oh, yeah. you make it tight. So just to keep people aware that uh, you just don't buy a machine and make your Bartek. So no, no, definitely more. Yeah, yeah, I, that was something for sure. I, I going into this, I thought it would be a little bit simpler, a little bit easier. You know, break a few samples. I know it's all you know, solid and sorted, but actually, fifty samples later, and I feel like I have a reasonable idea of what I've tested now. But what I haven't tested, you know, there's there's still a few unknowns around. So, uh, regardless, I feel like I'm in a much better place than I was when I first started. But it was a lot longer of a road than I thought it would be. Um, yeah. Yeah, in regards to tension of the thread, basically, you know, if I put the tension too high, it'll just start to pull one side of the thread through to the other side of the webbing, you know, and if I put it too low, it'll do the opposite. So I'm just uh, adjusting it for each webbing sample so that it's pulling roughly equal tension on both sides of the loop. You know, it's not favoring the bobbin thread or the top. Is there a measure for that? I uh, know it's uh, basically I'll just sew a sample of the webbing and um, you know just adjust uh, the machine. Yeah, yeah just exactly. adjust the, the distance in between exactly. the head, the head and the bottom. Oh, cool. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's got a little a little uh, dial. I'll show you a photo on the thing, but I'm sure it's similar on most machines. Uh, yeah, I don't know if you guys can see my mouse or not, but that's it there in the center. Yeah, we can. Yep. Yeah. But yeah, that just adjusts the tension coming from the top one. And then I can adjust the tension on the bobbin, but usually just by changing that uh, mm. is good enough. Yeah, and then uh, another interesting thing was stitch length, actually, with a straight stitch machine, because um, uh, what's it called? Yeah, if you do the stitch length too short, you know, the distance between each consecutive stitch, it's pretty self-explanatory. Um, yeah. The Obviously, yeah, you're putting a lot more a lot more holes through the webbing on like it, it doesn't really like I didn't really find it cut the webbing whatsoever it more or less it just parts it regardless of what needle is used um, but the yeah the longer the stitch length was better for polyester webbings you know where the stretch is low and you're making the box a lot longer um, so something around seven mil was good for that Whereas the, uh, for the nylon and making smaller boxes somewhere around the five to six mil stitch length, you know, maybe, yeah, probably more like five mil stitch length seemed to work better. Yeah, I think um, Sarah's asked as well if I have a table of stitching in their break tests. I do have a, a table made up, which I can share to people, but I don't think it's going to be that, like, it's it's not very... It doesn't, you know, share anything too new or too groundbreaking at all. It's it's all pretty boring and mostly um, a lot of abbreviations and, you know, things in there. It'll be difficult to understand for people who aren't me just because, you know, I've put down my own <laughs> descriptions of what stitches I've used and that's a bit hard to do in words. But I'll share it regardless to whoever wants to see it. Yeah, I'd be really keen to hear um, Stefan's thoughts on this as well someday. He was very keen on the boxes. 
Yeah, yeah. Oh, Richard's comment is quite interesting as well. Yeah, the speed of the um, the needle is definitely a pro. Do you, do you find that Richard that um that that affects the breaking strength of dog bones or whatnot that you've tested? Um, look, I, I haven't done a, a lot looking at stitching because I haven't got any stitching machines. Um, but certainly in times that I've spent with other manufacturers looking at the way they're bar taking things, um, that heat management is a, is a huge issue. Um, and not, not just with breaking threads, but with potentially um, changing the properties of the, 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 the host material when you're stitching through it as well. But I, I haven't tested them directly, no. Okay, yeah, that's really interesting though. Thanks for that. Um, do you have any way to inspect the needles? What do you mean by inspect the needles? Oh, it's just to be sure that the needle is sharp enough to go through the webbing and not cut it, that there is nothing on the needle that can damage the webbing. Or how do you change the needles? Is there a frequency of changing the needles, inspecting the needles? I uh, guess you don't have an X-ray machine to get the needle. No, no, I don't. X-ray. No. Um, yeah, I found, I mean, like, the needle getting blunter doesn't seem to be a problem because if anything... Mm. Because it will go yeah. blunt rather than sharper. Yeah, exactly. It's not going to yeah. get too sharp that it'll start cutting the webbing. And, you know, when it's brand new, it seems to make no difference on the brake tests. Mm. Um, yeah, I've only changed a few around because they last pretty well, being quite thick, heavy duty. Um, I, th I think they're 21 or 22. I forget what letter comes before it as well. Um, again, this is <laughs> a whole world that I've only just broken into but it's um yeah again i just thought i'd share these results last minute that you know being interesting to add more to that that world oh and thanks sarah for that yeah um in regards to the rounded needles and the blunt uh the blunt end needles basically um yeah i talked to the the guys I bought this machine off who, you know, they've got 10, 20 years in the industry and in repairing machines and whatnot. And they, uh, they basically laughed me out the store when I said I wanted blunt needles to go through webbing. They said, it's ridiculous. It's not possible. It's never going to work. Um, so, I mean, again, I think their experience with stitching webbing is not as it's nowhere near as, as high as, as it is on, you know, people who literally produce sewn loops for a living. Um, but regardless, yeah, I haven't seemed to to find any any dec yeah, I haven't tested blunt needles yet, to be honest, but there doesn't seem to be a problem using the sharp ones either. Yeah, in, in regards to Lorenzo's comment as well, uh, he says basically stitching parallels of the line should be better than perpendicular like a bar tech, which you know, makes sense intuitively. Um, and I definitely found that on weaker samples as well. I test a lot of, um, I tested a lot of 11 KN Bunnings webbing just to begin with to, to have a look at a whole bunch of different, um, different patterns. And I was getting a hundred percent on those samples by the end, always just doing in parallel. Um, yeah, by doing bar tacks on them on weaker, it was polyester as well, but on weaker webbing it, essentially just cut them and it always broke at that first tack. Um, and I assume that would follow through to the heavier duty, you know, higher strength webbings, which it for the most part did. <laughs> Who is the one person making a living off loops that doesn't want to comment? They don't have to comment, but we can still get to know their name. Oh, I'm not sure I've met them before. Oh, and thanks for that, Richard, as well. That's um, yeah, I'll flick you an email. That sounds great. What's the um, what's the next talk on, Kat? It's Sarah talking about what the perfect anchor should look like. Oh, that sounds really good. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Chris. By the way, that was that was pretty good. No worries. Yeah, what thank you. you want how would you improve your testing setup? Like what wishes do you have for it? Oh, I mean, 
having a longer travel distance would be great because it's about a uh, roughly 100 mil, 150 mil travel distance. So for nylon webbings, you get you hit that peak every time before you break it. You have to reset a couple times. Um, and then the other thing is a more accurate uh, gauge. And mo this joke is lost on most people here, but most people don't know Brendan Plaza, but uh, he just... <laughs> He destroyed the pressure gauge on it a bit, so it still works well, but it's just permanently set a few psi higher. So you just every every recorded result is now a few psi. What did he do? <laughs> I'm not sure. I think he ramped it up to like you know 80 kn or something. Yeah, right. <laughs> oh no, that's right. Those that's when he tested his soft shackles. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, so having a more accurate readout would be good. Basically, the way I've gotten my results is by testing a sample in the machine between web locks and then testing sewn loops and then comparing the PSI from both of those. To get an actual KN figure on it, though, I put so it's a, a... relative. It's always percentage. It's relative, exactly, yeah. How um, can you calibrate it? Do you want to? Well, so I've, I've put a dyno in and ramp, you know, and calibrated the PSI or um, equated the PSI to the dynamometer reading, but that only goes so far, you know, because the, the dyno itself, it's a rock exotica one and we don't want to get it above 20 because then it's permanently, has a little thing that says, you know, it's gone above 20. So we get it up to about 15, 16 KN and then go, okay, cool. So we can equate the PSI up to there, but then anything above that is just extrapolation. And I'm not sure what's, what the issue is, but basically, you know, none of the numbers really line up very well, including the weblock to weblock samples. You know, like if you say, okay, the webbing should be 30 kn, and theoretically we're getting 23 kn out of a weblock, doesn't say, you know, and this is quite a bit. What kind of well. webbing was it? <laughs> this is it like a 35 mil bend radius, you know, in a in a weblock, it should be getting much higher than 23 out of set out of 30. Um, so there's just something off between the uh, the equation there, equating the KN to the, the PSI. But as a percentage-wise, comparing the percentage of whatever it breaks out in the web locks compared to its own loops, that all seems to make a lot of sense. And that all equates well to other testing done out there. Hydraulic gauges do not like repeated sudden releases. Yeah, it's, it's probably what's done it for this one then. <laughs> yeah, I think um, I think that Ryan Jenks's pulley system is the nicer, cheaper version. Hey, Chris, Navini, I had a question. Yep. Uh, do you think if, if you were able to get the right type of thread that you're using, uh, do you think it's possible to get a similar efficiency uh, in terms of strength if it is hand done, like doing these kind of things by hand? Do you think uh, it's obviously tedious, but do you think it's possible? Yeah, it's really interesting. I, th I think a lot of that comes down to the needle as well as the thread. Um, because I tried this, I uh, tried a sample with a speedy stitcher. Um, I don't know if you've seen them around, but they're basically, you know, a hand stitching device with a really big, thick needle on the front with a really sharp point. And the way that one works really well is because the, the point is so sharp, you know, you can cut through leather, webbing, whatever, but it does damage it significantly in the process. So if you can get a needle, uh, I mean, the, the needles, like you can pass through webbing, especially soft ones, uh, soft weaves like Feather Pro, you can pass through no problem. Um, I guess the, the only issues I could see with that really would be getting, um, the tension on the thread really nice the whole time and also doing enough stitching because, you know, anyone who's done to stitch stuff by hand knows just how long it takes. And once you get, you know, half an hour in, you go, oh, this should be good enough. So <laughs> again, like I'd say you wouldn't want to do it without breaking a fair few samples to really know what 
what it's what's happening um you know which is a long and tedious process by hand i think it'd be much easier to find a friend with a machine thanks Chris. no worries do do you have a big piece of plywood to prevent things flying out of that yeah we used yeah. to have a similar we used to yeah. have a similar on the garage with a big uh, car jack Yep, yep. And you can go up to 30, 35 k you know, or something and things fly quite fast. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, this this particular jack, we've gotten up to about 80, 85 k and we think a couple times now, and it gets really scary. We've got a big um a bit of 14 mil perspex to put in front, which is quite nice. But yeah, it's still still extremely scary. Yeah. It's <laughs> quite loud. It's quite loud when it breaks. Yeah, exactly. I should really be wearing more hearing protection for it. <laughs> but uh yeah and i i think that's how well I'd, I'd suspect that's how many manufacturers would test their webbing richard but i i think if you just put it in um either their highest efficiency web lock or you know custom made web lock of about 100 mil diameter but they don't necessarily wrap it in an endless hitch it, you know it's um I think the ISA standards on that, I'm not sure what they say, but when there's, because there's now a testing, like a, a te uh, what's it called? The whale. The what? Isn't it the whale? Isn't it the whale, the big line locker? Who who uses that? ISA, isn't it? Oh, okay. Uh, Is that what they use for their samples? Uh, my understanding is that, yeah, that's a very big, Okay, okay. So, yeah, it's not an endless hitch. It is just a big line locker. Yeah. Okay, interesting. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we do have here one of those, maybe Boller, uh, as Richard is saying. Yeah. Uh, which you just wrap it around and try to make it a couple of rounds and then go in. Yeah, yeah. Definitely the smaller diverter on the web lock is a totally different thing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you'd almost think that's how the ISA should be doing their standards, given that's how it's most likely to be used. Yeah, well, that's a big discussion, right? Oh, uh, oh yeah. Walter, Walter Siever is showing it, showing the way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so that's the that's the one for the independent. Yeah, system. that's the one. That's, yeah, yeah. That looks super lightweight, yeah. Walter. <laughs> you don't want that to be flying around, eh? <laughs> You could almost repurpose some of Jerry's old monster locks. Okay, well, should we begin on Sarah's uh, anchor talk?